Last year we did Fire Command. This year we're going to do Bomber Command, often called Bomber County. All of the big bomber bases are all based in Lincolnshire. I'm Lincolnshire through and through. The plan is we're going to have a go at each of the jobs. This is me standing next to the Lancaster bomber that, surprisingly, is a lot smaller than you would think. It's only, like, it's only the length of, like, two buses. So, hang on, I'm going to get in here. You get to that age, don't you, where you start making them involuntary groans when you get in and out. We're going to get in the back. Rear gunner. That's the tractor. Don't take notice of the tractor. You know, when you get bloody up at the height these things flew, you'd be bloody minus 40 in the back here. And look at that. It in gap. Hey? Hey? Well, but then they said it was probably the worst job of the Second World War, being dragged over Germany backwards. Right, we're going to go to the next place. Not very thick paneling. Well, that won't even stop a pellet gun coming through that, would it? Look. Up in there, that's the bomb storage. So, look, we're having to go up this step here because we've got bombs below. You see what we've got here? This is mid-upper gunner. Bit of a view. And then we're mantling up over here. This is a big wing spare. And usually that, you know, sort of below the fuselage, but because this plane was all about carrying as many bombs as possible, that meant having the main wing spare inside the plane. So that's what you have to climb over there. All right, what we got here? Radio operator goes here. Look at that, busy fellow. Right, and then if we get lost, we've got the Astrodome. You see, we can get a look here. It sounds a bit funny when I'm in here now, don't it? And that's how we can navigate off the stairs. Let me see them lovely engines there, can't you? Right. Navigator's place. Flight engineer. These are all his knobs and buttons and what have you. And then we've got the main man in here. This is the pilot's seat. Right. Oh, you bugger, I don't want to be touching them, do I? This is where the bomb aimer went. You see? And there'll be a gun in here as well. So it'd be the front gunner as well as the bomb aimer. There we go, telling the pilot left, left, right, right. Right, press the button, bomb's gone. Bomb's gone. Yeah, it's a hell of a plane. Like in 1942, this is like space age technology. I've like flown by lads that probably didn't have a car license. You know, like 20 year olds. <laughs> Get a grip of that, eh? My word. My word. It's quite a bit rusty, boy. Guy will get behind the controls of the aircraft belonging to the Lincolnshire Heritage Aviation Museum in East Kirkby, near Skegness. Flight Lieutenant Mike Chatterton was one of the RAF's most experienced large aircraft pilots. Yeah, what a man to be doing it with. I mean, I'm sure I've seen you fly the Lancaster no end of times. You're going to have a go at teaching me. This privately owned aircraft is three years into a 10-year restoration to return it to the sky. So while Guy can't fly it yet, he has been granted the rare privilege of taxiing it. So go on, what's it, what's it like? I would say that even though you've got four mighty Merlin engines, you've also got a very heavy aeroplane. OK, OK, so OK. a bit of a lag built in with it all. World War II pilots said that if you could taxi a Lancaster to the runway, then you could fly it anywhere. Try and get the left wheel on the concrete, not on the grass, on the concrete. Flight engineer Brad Winder will monitor the engines in a cockpit. Okay, so where it's going to get noisy now. Yeah, yeah. So if you go to the crew chief and give him the signal star number three. Uh, got oil pressure, fuel pressure light is out. OK. We've got to set 1200 on the RPM. Yeah. <laughs> Clear four, turning four. Thank <laughs> you. 
Pull the brake trigger and it has a bit of an effect. You can go a bit more, a couple more presses, and then it starts going where you want it to. If you want it to go where you want it, a little bit faster, and you want to go to the right, put the left-hand engine off. If you've got the right-hand brake on with the left-hand engine on, it'll nearly pull you around on the sequence. You can tell he's used to operating old aeroplanes. With four Merlins, each one has an individual character, so each one has to be treated slightly differently on the throttle. <laughs> I then said to him, right, you know, well, now consider that's the training over. Show me what you can do. So we went and did what we call a high noise run, sort of simulating a takeoff. I'll give you a thumbs up. Your release of brakes will try and st stay in a straight line. Ready? Yeah, good. Right. Um, 2,000 RPM coming up. Yeah, good on the carriage, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was heading for the fence, but I sort of knew, I knew how much mass you had there. I knew back off the throttles and just get on the brake, and then we locked it up a little bit. Nice, good, guy. Nice, good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Pleasure. Thank you. What I liked was that he understood what was happening. It wasn't as if it was a, a blur. As soon as we got moving, it started veering off to the left, and I tried to get us racing top. Nothing. Nothing like the wheel. I think when we came back in here, the concrete is a lot more precise because you've got less space on here, and the power t tends to run away if you're not careful because there's less resistance. I wasn't too sure if I was going to be able to let him do that or not. But by that stage, I was quite happy. Come right a bit. And we brought it in nice and slowly. You'll see when you get past that corner, we can just come left a little bit and line up at the edge of the concrete. And then he just had it in exactly the right position. Hey, OK, to stop there. Brilliant. It's really nice. Very nice. Crack and break on. And the people on board were saying that's better than our normal pilots do. Definitely better than some of them. I know. Do what you ask it to, and he does it with a bit of delay. So considering the conditions, I thought that went really well. No, thank you. Thank um, you for having, having a bit of faith in it. <laughs> and we didn't put it on its roof, we didn't crash. Can I imagine flying it? Yeah. Yeah. Come back again. Would you be so, interested so in taxiing here? Bloody right, I would. Would you? I was looking for people to yeah, do, come and do it. Good. Oh, bloody <laughs> right, I was. Time for the next Lancaster job. Brace yourself. We think this is the first time a mid-up turret has fired a bullet since late 40s. But we have seen a few Euro fighters flying over in the past half hour or so. So if we could get one of them, or if we could get their attention, it might be fun. <laughs> Go on. Just mind your head on here. Yeah. And you've got to try and traverse yourself around this bit here. Yeah. Cheers. Foot picks for your feet there. What the hell is busy in here, isn't it? Where your right hand is. Yeah. Fine. So that's going to be your trigger. Hold that in for continuous fire. OK, sound. The size of them bloody bullets. Hey. <laughs> what, eight hours? Trip there and back. Eight hours just staring. I, I think you'd be shooting it out, wouldn't you? As soon as you see someone's anything, you've got to shoot them before they shoot you. We've got a few more bullets we haven't used. Yeah, I think we should have another go here, aren't we? Come on. That's a bloody aura fighter we missed. Firing! Three, two, one. Yeah, that was a goer, boy. Yeah, we're out of bullets on the right-hand side. 1,200 bullets a side a minute, so that's 2,400 bullets per minute out of this, out of this one lump. <laughs> Could I have been a goer? 
Yeah, of course I would. You would. Of course I would. You know, if the flight engineer's not keeping his eye on the gauges, yeah, you're just going to destroy engines because they're not... <clears throat> I'm going to use the word headproof. And because they operated at night in cockpits with little light, most of this complex information had to be committed to memory. It's got to be sort of engrained, so you're not having to... Oh, what was it? That'd be me. Oh, God, what was it? And then I've crashed or I've blown it up. Yeah. Oh. So it's all right, we're going to bottle that in. Yeah, that's another week's work. One man, a full week to get that ready to go. That's a pipe it all in, put the props on, tighten it all up, radiator on the bottle. Spot on. What's better than fitting an engine in a Lancaster bomber? Fitting two engines in a Lancaster bomber? Right. Hold yeah, on. you're all right here. If you come straight down yeah. for me, you'll be all right. I was say, mate, if you want a job, I know it's a bit far to travel, but, you know. Yeah, it'll be well suited. Right, I love it. I bloody love it. Watch those hand movements. Broadcasting to the world with an original Lancaster radio set, Guy's local radio ham society can teach him the basics. That's it. That's it all Fair done. Fair play. It's a pleasure to watch. Just sort of second nature to you. Peter Kendall, who served on the RAF Vulcan bomber that Guy once worked on, is helping his new recruits send a typically abbreviated wartime message. So the best which is 73 is... Just like that. Oh, I thought that was good. I mean, he's, he's just touched a Morse key for the first time in his life. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. I've got it written out in front of me. It's time for Guy Martin to try the most important Lancaster role of all, bomb aimer. Do you want a cup of tea? And for some advice, he calls in on a very special expert. Now in his 100th year, George Johnny Johnson is the last surviving dam buster. You're a Lincolnshire lad originally. I do me do, I read, yeah. <laughs> and the practice, not briefed, but done just for the head of it, was to fly under the cables and up over the bridge. Okay. In a Lancaster bomber. Absolutely <laughs> wonderful, it really was. Right, absolutely. I know something bridge, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the tenth run, we were down to 30 feet. When I said, bomb gone, thank Christ came for the rear turret. Just I like can that. imagine. Have you got any tips? Yeah. Concentrate. On the bomb side and the target and make sure they're in line before you drop the bomb. Spot on. X marks the spot. So, target sussed. Uh, what do we need now? We need a plane. Now, the plane we're going to use is a Tiger Moth. They did plan on using the Tiger Moth as a bomber in 1940, because if we ever got invaded, the plan was to defend our beaches using the Tiger Moth dropping bomb. Guy's pilot will be vintage aviation specialist, Paul Ford. Contact. Operation Flower Drop can commence. Go for your life, Bob. This is the right speed and the right height. There goes nothing. <laughs> We hit the wall. A bit later. We need to go a bit later then. Guess the radio through, they're in the trees. Oh. Close but no cigar, really. Right, so now I know what I need to do. I need to see the towers, right? Count one, two, and a bit, and then drop one, drop the other. Okay, and now we're over the lake now. Bomb doors open. Bombs outside. Ten seconds, Paul Island. Okay. Steady. Steady. Bombs away. There goes the cookie. Okay, okay, okay.
I've been volunteering in Bomber Command. Probably. Was I clever enough? Probably not. What would I have been doing? I'd have probably been T Boy or I'd have been ground crew. But what I want to be, what I want to be, rear gunner. I'd be tailing Charlie by getting dragged over Germany backwards. What a job. <laughs> 